A very good evening to all our viewers here in North America, in Guyana, and around the world. We want to welcome you back to Globespan 24-7 as we bring you our Monday night program. Of course, from our guest in Guyana and sometime our co-host in Guyana as well, but today he's back in New York. Oh. So we want to welcome all of you. We want to thank you, our audience, for being a part of us. And of course, to Nohar Singh uh, for making this platform available and to Devin Bisu, our technical specialist, for carrying us along. This evening, we have no stranger to us. He has been uh, one of the most regular uh, guests in our program, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, and now leading the Guyana um, delegation to the border controversy in Venezuela. Ambassador Carl Greenwich, welcome to the program tonight. Thank you ever so much, Charles and, uh, and uh, Euclid. And, and also, Devin, I, I see I have to say, but so thanks very much for the opportunity. And I'm surprised to hear that I'm such a regular, um, a regular <laughs> guest in your program. Well, I'm very honored, and we're very honored to have you, sir. It's my pleasure. And of course, my co-host, Dr. Rose. Dr. Rose, welcome. Welcome to the program, all to all our listeners, and welcome, Mr. Greenwich. Thanks Thank for being here. Ambassador, the last time we met, you had given us an indication, and I think you had, were definitive that there was this application to the World Court that they had jurisdiction on the Venezuela Guyana controversy. And I think definitively you said they did rule that they had jurisdiction. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. The court ruled on December 18, 2020 rejecting every single one of Venezuelans, asser Venezuela's assertions, and more specifically to answer your question, including the decision that by virtue of what was signed on the Geneva Agreement of 1966, and also by virtue of the enhanced mediation process, which Venezuela and Guyana engaged in, from 2016 until the beginning of 2018, that Venezuela had committed itself to the, if you like, submitting to the authority of the court. And it's very clearly and unambiguously set out in the Geneva Agreement, which they seem to believe is the beginning and the end of everything. But whenever <laughs> it comes to interpreting it, they seek to interpret it differently. So the court says, yes, we've got jurisdiction, Two, uh, we've seen the complaint from Guyana, and uh, Guyana must present its case by March 7th, 2022, which we did. And Venezuela has to present its case by March 2023. Now, since then, if, you, if you'd like an update, since then what has happened is that Venezuela, through its uh, um, vice president, has named an, uh, an agent and two co-agents, and it has also, um, a month or so, or a few weeks later, indicated that it had a problem with Guyana's application, meaning that Venezuela felt that uh, it was being put in a situation before the court where the court um, was not in a position to hear the, the parties, or shall I put it more correctly, Venezuela claims that the counterpart, their counterpart, if they're to go to court, although they don't agree that court has the jurisdiction, should not be Guyana, but should be the United Kingdom. And therefore, uh, they were calling on the court to uh, abandon that line. The court uh, did ask us for a view, and we gave a view, which suggests that this really was a red herring, uh, had no basis. And uh, Venezuela had at the same time sought to get the court's permission to allow Guyana and Venezuela to submit written documentation to submit in writing, in other words, the substantive disagreements between the two sides. Well, 
the legislation, the rules don't make provision for that. And if that were done, it would have added considerably to the time uh, available for hearing. And so at this point in time, the court has rejected that. And it has allowed the two parties, as it originally um, intended, to meet with a view to making oral presentations uh, on Venezuela's objections, uh, Venezuela's problem it has with the, with the case um, on 17th to the 22nd of November. The original dates were October, but uh, Guyana could, Guyana found itself in some difficulty uh, due for medical reasons of key people and therefore, um, we asked the date be shifted, the date was shifted, and both Venezuela and the court have accepted 17th to the 22nd of November, 2023. 23 or 22? Sorry, <laughs> 22. Okay. 22nd November next, 17th to the 22nd of November next. That is That's next month. That's correct. And what are, what are the submissions for again? <clears throat> The oral, the oral presentation will allow uh, the court to hear Venezuelan, Venezuela's um, objections to the, mem to the, well, to the memorial in the sense that they're saying that the memorial isn't properly before the court. And uh, that is what it will be about. And we will, of course, when that is finished, return to the substantive issue of what are the merits and demerits of the original complaint from Guyana, namely that the court should pronounce on the uh, status of the 1899 award, whether or not it's valid, and what all the things that follow from it. So if I hear you correct, um, Ambassador um, Greenwich, is that we're having an oral submission on November the 17th and 19th, in relation to Venezuela saying that Great Britain should have been the party petitioned the, petitioning the court for this award? Correct. Correct. Okay. So, so they've tried a curveball there because over the years, when we were, in, give us some, some advice here, some um, edification here, Ambassador. When we were at the UN Secretary General who was handling it with the, um, they call it, the special enhanced enhanced en enhanced mediation. But before that, you had the special officer. Oh, oh yes, okay, okay, right. But that was Great Britain any part of that? Nowhere. Exactly. So why <laughs> why Venezuela agreed then to talk to Guyana, but now they want Venezuela to having Great Britain to be part of it? Well, at that point in time, it, it made no difference either way. They, they, there was a sort of a a good office process going on, which didn't go forward or backwards. So it didn't make any difference to them. Venezuela's intent in these en engagements is to convert the process into a process that runs into infinity, right? It, it, it is not, it is not, the matter is not to be solved. So it didn't matter then. But now that you've moved to a process where there has to be a definitive decision and deadlines have been set because they have to make their submission. We have to make our submission. The court can't take forever to give an answer. Now it's important that they, they divert or waste time as much as they can. So that's the process they've embarked on. So Ambassador, as I said, this is only for the, what Venezuela is claiming that the petition should be made in Great Britain. And yes. that presentation is going to be made now, and then the court will rule on that. Absolutely. How, how long after did you think they might rule on that? Well, I'm hoping that it will, I'm hoping it will take them no time, uh, because okay. uh, we feel from what we see that the court, the case is frivolous. Of course I, it is. I, I mean, any, any logical person, the right man thinking people will consider exactly what you said there. But in terms of, you're saying, Guyana submit their written submission, they made a written submission, 
um, in March of this year, and Venezuela will until next year, March, is make their written submission? Correct. And and we substantive, we, that's a substantive, that is substantive yeah. part of the case. Absolutely. Okay. And we've, even, we've even submitted a written response to Venezuela's complaint. And the, the, the court gave us until the 22nd of October, and we responded to it within a matter of a, a couple of weeks. Okay, so Guyana is adhering to all the deadlines, but we're not sure if Venezuela will meet the March 2023 deadline. Well, if they don't meet the deadline, it will make no difference to the case. The court will proceed. The court will and let's proceed. assume, um, Ambassador... Unless, that, they, come up, unless they come up with some outrageous excuse for not submitting. But if you tell the court that you are not recognizing the court and you're not proposing to participate, which is what they said at the beginning, it's a little bit hard to come on the day or a few days before the deadline and say, give me more time, please, because it's clear that your intention never was to participate. So they're in a tricky place, I think. And I think the court have professional judges there, so they, they know when people are um, you know, dragging their foot on issues. The judges are very experienced. Yeah, and if Venezuela submit their proposal by March 2023, Ambassador, how long after that do you think that there will be a hearing and a determination of the case? Well, I don't want to answer for the court, but what I can say I've seen is that the court in recent cases, the ones I've observed, after the hearing and the exchanges on the, um, on the memorials that they received, within six to nine months, they, they, they've been responding in recent times. They're giving the decision within that time. But that, I'm, I'm saying that what, not with an intent of binding the court to anything or embarrassing them, but that is what has, that's what has happened. And even in the case of Kenya versus Somalia, the, the response was within that period. Although so we are prior, looking, prior to so that, it was dragged out for years. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at maybe the winter of 23 or the spring of 24. I'm, sure. I'm, ho I'm hoping. Okay. Dr. Rose? Yes. Uh, Mr. Greenwich. Sir. Venezuela is participating, but is it truly and really participating in the process or is making a mockery of it? Well, so far, I would say that uh, they have uh, worked to rule, okay? So the court re has required them to do things, that is, since uh, December of 2020, and they have done as required of them. Now, the rules do allow them, for example, to join the process and to complain as they've done. That is a rule, uh, one of the court's rules, that if they have a complaint about about the, um, if you like, the, the regulations, whether they're respected or not, they have to lodge the complaint within a month of the memorial, and they did it on the day of the deadline. Okay? So you can't fault them for that. And from now going forward, uh, the court will ask them to do things, um, and they can at any point, in fact, choose to stop and uh, abandon their involvement at that stage. So I, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to say to you they haven't done anything wrong so far, at least not in this the merits phase of the court hearing. And but it it uh, it doesn't mean that in future they may not either try to divert or to withdraw. Like all legal systems do have rules, and the right. ICJ, the International Court of Justice do have rules. What are some of the rules the court issued to Venezuela and issued to Guyana comply? Well, the rules the rules are too many for me to try, and, and you, since I'm give not us, a lawyer... Give us, the, give us the main ones, then. <laughs> it is too. I think the, the rule that matters here is this, that both parties are members of the, U, of the UN, and therefore, uh, and by virtue of that, um, parties to the ICJ agreement, in fact. And, and therefore, whether or not they, they participate, whether or not both participate, 
both are bound by the decisions of the court. Even if the court responds and doesn't respond favorably to the country that petitioned it. So in, in at the end of the period, which uh, Mr. Sugrim is referring to, when the court pronounces, both parties have to be bound by the court's decision, whether or not they like it. Okay. That's the key, key one. That's the key one. Okay, I'll come back to that just now. The court, as Guyana has issued its memorial. Yes. Memorial means its oral arguments, I think was when? March of this year? Yes, March the 7th, we submitted the, the memorial. Right. Is there, Venezuela, instead of submitting a memorial, submitted preliminary objections to Guyana's memorial? Does the court permit Venezuela to see Guyana's memorial and vice versa? Yes, the court works this way. As soon as you submit the document to them, they arrange to have it translated and distributed to the other party. And as soon as they are ready to begin the case, both documents are available to the world on the ICJ website. So they will be they'll be on the website when they are uh, going to be jointly formally considered by the court. So by March, all of them will be on there. So have you seen Venezuela's objections or have Ghana team? Yes, in yes, yes. Venezuela. What, as soon as, what are some of the objections? Well, you know, you know, these lawyers are very imperialistic, very turf, turf sensitive, and for that reason. I have uh, to be very careful. So what um, what I think I'm permitted to say to you is the objection suggests that between them, Britain and Guyana did not remember or didn't know how um, uh, responsibility or jurisdiction was transferred or transitioned from the colonial power to uh, the, the colony. And therefore, um, that is why Venezuela is saying, look, yes, we, we signed the agreement with Britain in 1899. We signed another agreement with Britain in 1966. And now uh, suddenly we are told we have to respond to Guyana, when in fact, uh, it is not we and Guyana who had any, any, uh, any uh, agreement. As far as they're concerned, Guyana hasn't properly inherited the powers from Britain. But I mean, I don't want to go through the arguments here, but it, it has to be obvious, I think, to everyone that in the period subsequent to February of 1966, and definitely after May of 1966, Venezuela has been speaking to Guyana without uh, an interlocutor. It has been speaking to Guyana, it has been coming to agreements without the involvement of Britain. And uh, it has either honored those agreements or rejected proposals without calling on Britain. The, the, the um, enhanced mediation, the process which Venezuela in all its documentation finds it convenient not to mention. When they say, oh, you know, we should talk because uh, this thing requires a bilateral solution. It must be amicably resolved. They don't want to mention that we had such a process of negotiation between the time that the Secretary General called us together in Washington in, in 2015, uh, the end of 2015, to the time when he wrote the two presidents in February of 2018, saying, look, this process has come to a halt. Uh, they don't like to mention it, but that is what was happening. Mr. Doug Newlander, myself, and the Venezuelan minister or ministers were involved in a process without Britain. And nobody told us, well, we can't speak to you. You must go back and ask Britain or we'll only, we'll only, uh, we'll only deal with, um, with uh, the the British ministers or the British prime minister. It wasn't said. We, we tried to negotiate a path ahead. Now, as I keep saying, Venezuela wasn't really interested, but that's, that's not the point to make here. 
The point to make here is that whilst we were engaged, they had no concerns about our local standard. Let me pin this question to you, and I stand corrected. Is Venezuela making the claim that there's been no clause in the 1899 agreement that states that Guyana should proceed with this case after independence? No, nothing like, they're not saying that. They're saying, they're saying in effect, they haven't seen any legislation which says that Guyana is empowered to, to discuss its own business and to, de, and to decide on its own borders. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. So it may seem. <laughs> Well, you see, part of the problem you have with Venezuela is Venezuela finds it very inconvenient to discuss the 1899 agreement. They actually do not want to discuss it because it does not mention Esequibo. It says nothing about Esequibo. It says nothing about transfer of land. And so when you see the Venezuelans put out any documentation, they will either tell you some craziness like this problem began in 1831, which is not true. 1831, Venezuela became independent of Gran Colombia. Right. But that is that is just a Venezuelan issue. It's got nothing to do with Guyana. Uh, in fact, if you're speaking to the Esequibo problem, the, the, the issue arose in 1648 right, when right. Spaniards gave Esequibo to the United Provinces. Right. So they don't like to deal with those. They want to go straight to 1966, which they said, well, if the 1899 treaty was valid, then there was no need to have uh, this understanding in 1966, and the border treaty is 1966. But can you imagine? They're saying we've signed a border treaty. The border treaty, as they call it, actually says nothing about the borders. It doesn't define the borders. It doesn't say where the border is or shouldn't or, or, or isn't, and it does not say anything about territory. All that it says is that in light of Venezuela's contention that the 1899 treaty is null and void, they will carry out a set, set of processes. The mixed commission of 18, the mixed commission of 1966, you know, a, a set of people um, such as uh, the, the um, uh, Donald Jackson, so Donald Jackson, and Desi Fee Ridley, and what's, her, what's his name, um, Dr. Shahabuddin, they were part of that, right? And there was a mixed commission set up to run from 66 to 70 to look at, at uh, concerns Venezuela had, because it's Venezuela had the concerns, not Britain or Guyana, and the concerns they raised had to do with documentation, allegation of improprieties, they never actually submitted a set of concrete complaints. The complaints were whispers that, oh, you know, the chairman of the committee spoke to the British judges and the British judges accommodated him. When we know, in fact, that the British judges were quite annoyed with um, the Masons, who uh, was a Russian, um, because, well, all right, yeah. But because he was insisting that the decision be unanimous. And in the end, in the interest of getting a decision that everybody embraced without any chance of recidivism, yes, all sides agreed. So it was unanimous. And it is very hard for you to get a unanimous decision that gives you one of the richest areas in the world, which is the mouth and estuary of the Orinoco. In, in fact, the importance of the river, the importance of what Venezuela has, Venezuela hides. When you see Venezuela writing about the Esequibo, they speak about this massive territory. Esequibo is a tiny river compared to the Orinoco. The Orinoco, in terms of water, in terms of its, uh, its uh, what do you call it? It's um, the, the, the floodplains, the area drains, is probably the largest river in the world. And that's notwithstanding being on the same continent as the Amazon, which is the largest river in terms of, of its size. But the Orinoco is an extremely deep river. It is, carries a lot of water. It has tributaries that cover a vast area. 
And that is what they were given, and all the strategic controls to the river. But now they want more. It isn't that it isn't that they're saying, "Oh, this is not and void. We'll give you back as we'll give you back Orinoco." Uh, I don't know if you heard this statement from Venezuela recently. They issued this statement that the absence of Venezuelan judges on the International Court of Justice would render any decision made by the court null and void. Have you heard that statement from them? Is there is there an absence of of Venezuelans from the International Court of Justice? The, no, no, the, the judges. Yeah, is there an absence of Venezuelan judges? I don't know. You tell me. Well, let me put it this way. I, I will share with you a note I did for the newspaper last week. Okay. The note says that Venezuela has made that claim. Okay. And, and I went on to say that the reason why the court had no Venezuelans is because uh, President Anrad, President of Venezuela at the time, right. was offered the option of choosing two of five judges. So he would choose two, the British Prime Minister would choose two, and his two judges and British two judges would choose a chairman. What happened? Instead of choosing two Venezuelans, he chose two Americans. Right, one, right. one was a former American president, and the other one is a former American attorney general, reputed to be two of the wisest um, legal luminaries outside of Britain. So there was a logic to why he chose that, and, 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 and the British did not object. And they, they agreed that the chairman was one of the best persons they could choose because he happened to have been the recipient of at least two Nobel nominations for his work on arbitration. So they were given in 1899 a chance to choose uh, judges. Did they choose a, a Venezuelan? No. Instead, they chose two Americans. And when the time came to choose a chairman, did they choose a Venezuelan? No, they chose a Russian. Now, the current court has 15 judges. As far as I'm aware, none of those is Venezuelan. So they were often the option of choosing what is called a judge ad hoc. He doesn't work for the Venezuelan government, but it can be a Venezuelan. Okay, just as in our case, it could be a Guyanese because we have no Guyanese on the on the on the on the board. What did Venezuela do? Venezuela chose the outgoing registrar of the ICJ. Now think about it. That is not a decision made by a fool. But down the road, I'm wondering whether they're going to come back again and say, you know, something we didn't have any Venezuelans on the board, on the court, on the panel. And therefore, it is null and void. But whose fault is that? They chose, they chose to fill the place that was available to Venezuela, just as they chose in 1899 to fill the two places available to Venezuela. It is a game. You can't uh, exercise choice through your president and then turn back years after the fact and claim that you didn't have representation on the board. If you look at other publications coming out of Venezuela, you will see a degree of dishonesty in these publications in which they were claiming, for example, one here says that Venezuela was denied the opportunity to have a Venezuelan on the panel. Judge, yeah. <laughs> Untrue. Untrue. And that's, this is what makes it difficult to deal with Venezuela as a credible opponent. In but but you, you're that. saying it's untrue, but did the ICJ respond to that? No, the, IG, the, ICJ, the ICJ has no need to respond to it. That is not a serious. That is for the public. That's where you try to fool up people who don't know what the facts are. So you go and you tell your Latin friends, you know, these English speakers, you know who they are. 
uh, and, and you tell them perfidious Albion. And they say, ah, yeah, yeah, we know Britain stole half of Mexico through the United States. And therefore, they don't want to hear more. But to go to a court, you're going to tell a court you actually chose, you actually chose the judge or the judges. And then you are going to argue that the, the case or the decision is invalid on that basis. One of the things about the judges is that they are required to look at, uh, to look at documents. And we have submitted in our memorial those facts. Our memorial has those facts. And should they ask, we can provide them with additional information. And what is more, they will have background information which, uh, which demonstrates that. So I haven't seen anywhere in the, Ameri uh, in the Venezuelan submission to the court that complaint. But you see it, you see it on the streets. It is for the public, the unlettered public. It's such is the contempt that some of us have for, for the public, that we could misrepresent things and give it to them in a manner that you can't give it to an authoritative body. Charles, over to you. Ambassador, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, currently, does Venezuela have a legal team to support their case before the ICJ? Yes, Venezuela has a legal team, and Venezuela's team is quite experienced. Um, and uh, when they came to the, to the case management, they brought a professor from the University of Oxford, again showing that they don't allow nationality to uh, pre prevent them from drawing upon the best skills available. The, this between themselves, Oxbridge are, are amongst the frontline universities of the world, certainly in terms of law and certainly in terms of the issues that are before us. Uh, even if we allow ourselves to be constrained by domestic politics and, and silly things, they don't. And how many how many part legal persons are on their team, do you know? On Venezuela's team? Yeah. Uh, no, because the court has only recently asked for the, the list of, of names to be submitted. And um, that process, I suppose, they're still going through because I know what happens, for example, names are sent and they come back to you asking you about a person's qualifications, where they had dinner or lunch or whatever it is that lawyers have, and uh, and their formal qualifications, their experience. How many um, legal luminaries do we have in the Guyana team? Well, we have many, and, and I'm going to answer you that way, not to be unhelpful, but to say to you that uh, when it comes to the crunch, you can carry almost uh, well, you, you, can, you can carry, or let me put it another way, the, the, this current session, because it's only an oral hearing on the specific point made by Venezuela, it is a, a restricted team in terms of numbers. Uh, the lawyers that the, the, the overseas team led by Sushridat are going to bring, uh, I could find that out. But it isn't, it isn't restricted by how we restrict ourselves here. The court and the court's proceedings involve both diplomats, diplomatic historians, and, his, and lawyers. On the Guyana, the domestic Guyana side, we carried those diplomats who are familiar with the history, who have worked with the UN, who have dealt with this problem, whether it in 66 or whenever. And that is why people, um, like Rudy Collins, for example, um, if Sushridat weren't, weren't there as a lawyer, he would have been there as a, as a diplomat who, who helped to set the ball rolling. Rashley Jackson, for example, very knowledgeable in these areas and, and, and others. But, uh, and you would have, for example, uh, Cedric Joseph, who is, uh, who is the number one historian on such matters. And, and, and we have, as you will remember, we have lost two of those very vital persons. Uh, one is Duke Pollard, who worked on these matters and Suriname from foreign affairs and from also from CARICOM um, and has published, uh, I think, more than anybody else on these matters in terms of the legal issues. 
and that matters. And uh, we we have uh, also lost, of course, uh, Rashley uh, Esmond Jackson, who uh, served both as PS. Uh, he like Sushri that served in different capacities. So he served as PS, working alongside and on the on the Sushri that, and subsequently PR and then uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. So um, it's that sort of mix of skills that is involved. And, that's the guy, uh, that's the guy, and that mix. What about the foreign the overseas uh, nationals who is part of our team? The overseas, Guyana overseas nationals uh, have two, two, two Guyanese. Um, one is Sushri that you know already, and the other is a young lady who, uh, who has been involved for a long time in, uh, and, and, and and recent research on uh, on matters pertaining to to Guyana and these issues before us. For international lawyers, what other nationalities? Yeah, the other nationalities, by almost by definition, if you're going to the court, you have to bear in mind that the court consists. The court has fifteen judges plus the judges ad hoc. Okay. And the, the, the 15 judges are of all sorts of nationalities. So you want to be able to speak to them. Are, are you with me? And yeah. I, don't, I, don't, yeah. I, don't mean, I don't mean speak to them like I'm speaking to you. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You have to understand uh, the, the, their interests and competencies. And for that reason, the, the private lawyers, that is the overseas team, that overseas team has a, a, a wide mix of lawyers, including um, uh, at least one non-English speaker who is regarded as probably the most authoritative person in his field, irrespective of language. And the name of that person? I don't want to be. <laughs> I don't want to be invidious. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, you don't want to. Say, you don't want to give away your legal team. Yes. All right. Um, okay. No problem. Um, uh, Ambassador, recently you would have known. Mm -hmm. that the UN vote that condemned Russia referendum on Ukraine, Venezuela did not vote. Yes. Is that giving us some indication of what Venezuela's real interest might be? Well, on this matter, I, I want to be cautious. The first reaction when the announcement of the Venezuelan, the announcement of the Russian troop movements around Ukraine took place. And it became increasingly clear that this was not a military exercise, which Mr. Putin was claiming it was. We, I think, small countries around the world started to get nervous. Have we moved into a new era in which Big countries, big countries with big bombs and big planes feel that they're at liberty to do as they wish because everybody else will be intimidated uh, and prevented from saying much or intervening. And um, we tried and, and um, actually prior, prior to that had been speaking even to the, the um, interlocutor of the, of the Russians. And, um, you know, they said to us, and we reminded them that Venezuela's attack on the 1899 agreement was also an attack on Russia. Okay? Because the, the, the chairman, Mr. Demasens, um, was a Russian national. And I remember Mr. Lavrov, Minister Lavrov, being most indignant when I told him that a Russian was being accused of, uh, of these misdemeanors. Uh, I don't know whether he still has that view, but what, what matters is that um, they gave us, you know, an assurance that as, as long-standing allies, they, they had no interest in, uh, in encouraging anybody to attack us. And you would have seen even some of the private sector had had uh, made a demarche on the ambassador 
here? And the ambassador more or less gave him the same answer. But you have to remember that in international relations and diplomacy in particular, countries look after their own interests. And those interests are, are usually not permanent in the sense that uh, you may have a friendship that is per permanent. So we have no proof that they have changed their view on such, on such a matter. But what, what we would know is Venezuela is a good ally of, uh, of Russia. Um, they have received all types of support from Russia. And therefore, one can see why they would refrain from um, a decision that gives the impression that they're hostile or they don't agree with anything that Russia is doing. For this, at this point in time, I think one can only observe, draw one's conclusions, and then allow diplomacy to work. You know, part of the problem here is, is the problem of a small country like Guyana understanding that you don't have a, uh, somebody sitting out there on the moon. If you are mistreated, who will come down and rescue you? You know, and it is really, it is really up to you to use your diplomatic muscles to work on Venezuela and Russia to ensure that they don't try to um, facilitate uh, military or non-diplomatic means to solve this problem. Of course, the, the Geneva Agreement, which the Venezuelans signed, and which they love to tell you everything begins and ends with the Geneva Agreement. That agreement is specifically and explicitly a means of peacefully resolving the controversy. And, and I see in recent times, Venezuelans putting on Facebook and uh, elsewhere um, demonstrations of, of war games where, where you see uh, citizens of Guyana being attacked and murdered by Venezuelans flying planes that Venezuela doesn't build. But um, this is, this is uh, the thing to, to understand and to answer is that we have to work on these countries ourselves. Use our diplomatic muscle, use our skills, use our nationals, use our soft power. Because I'm, I'm, glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because you know it's public knowledge now that Guyana is an oil producing nation. Yes. And the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Kuwait, they have excellent relation with Maduro. Yeah. Are we not using that channel to nudge Maduro to get this thing over with? Well, we have we have not been insensitive to that in the past, and we have tried. Uh, I I myself had attended together with President uh, Hoyt, President uh, Granger, and 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 the late um, Kadskan, for example. The Latin America, um, Latin America, um, Saudi Arabia, Middle East summit, and in that forum did raise this problem, um, and even on that occasion we were able to persuade, for example. Uh, Argentina to embrace uh, our former words as regards uh, um, border disputes that both Saudi Arabia and Ga both sorry that both Argentina and Guyana were comfortable with. We arrived at the meeting having not been at the earlier meetings to find a former words that was unacceptable to Guyana. And Guyana raised this matter from the floor. Saudi Arabia didn't want to reopen an issue, said, well, you should have been here at the other meetings. And this is something for our governments to learn. You don't go to meetings for the benefit of, of people traveling 
or getting an, uh, an exciting visit. You go to meetings because things are said and agreements are arrived at. And if the agreement is arrived at in your absence, people are not going to change because you didn't come. You say, well, you know, my people were busy. Anyway, we did manage to get them to, to, um, to accept a different formulation at a subsequent meeting. And uh, you are right. That is the point I'm making, that you have to keep talking and working with these countries to work on each other and to, to speak on your behalf. We've been trying. I don't okay. know uh, what success there has been recently because I haven't been involved in those meetings. I haven't seen the output. But uh, I have no doubt that the people um, who are to make the decisions are aware of what needs to um, needs to be done and what needs to happen. Were you in any meeting currently with President Ali and the Middle East people in concerning the border? No. No, okay. Um, and what you just said there, Ambassador Greenwich, we have heard that over and over again, that Guyana has not been attending meetings that is important for Guyana. And I think, I hope our politicians are listening and these meetings are important to attend because as you said, when decisions are made and you're absent, well, you're the one who lose. Um, Ambassador, I don't know if you saw on social media at 1932 Venezuelan stamp that is circulating. Did you see that? I have seen, I have seen the um, the image of the stamp, and uh, I can say to you what I've written in a note uh, for other purposes for the advisory committee when it meets. That is that during the course of our first set of discussions as an advisory ministerial committee. Now I'm speaking to 2015. Uh, the former minister, Rashley Jackson, the late Rashley Jackson, drew to our attention that there existed uh, um, such stamps and that we should try as a Ministry of Foreign Affairs to work with our con counterparts or even the min the, the post office to locate to locate this stamp. Um, so when last week it emerged, I wasn't surprised. We had not been able to find it, but we were aware. Now we were aware of its existence. And what I want to say to you is that the significance of the stamp is not that it proves, which is what our headlines say, it proves. Yeah. That, um, <laughs> that uh, Venezuela actually acknowledged that Ven that Esequibo was not part of Venezuela. What it, what it is, is this. It was a, a stamp commemorating the tripartite agreement, Venezuela, Brazil, and Guyana, on the boundary. You know, uh, an agreement was signed in 28 between uh, Brazil and Venezuela. And then subsequently between Guyana, Brazil, and Venezuela in 32, which says, look, this is where the borders of the three countries meet. Okay. And uh, this is the point. And they subsequently put down markers in those spots. Now, th there are many things proving that what Venezuela is saying to the world are, are just fabrications. So this is just another one. This alone doesn't establish the case. Uh, but it does it does confirm that at least at that point in time, Venezuela not only acknowledged the border they agreed in 1899, the border that they marked out in 1905, but it confirmed more importantly with a fourth country. When I say fourth, other than with Britain, what those borders were, and that is why the whole process that or the whole song and dance that Venezuela is taking us through is so absurd because that stamp, uh, or let me put it another way, the boundary that the, the stamp commemorates is a boundary that is part of a, an agreement between Venezuela, Brazil, and Guyana. 
And so you can't wake up a morning and decide, because I'm bigger than Guyana, I'm going to force Guyana to agree that that boundary doesn't exist. So are we giving that stamp to our legal team to support? Yeah, the, the, stamp, we, the thing is, at this point in time, um, I don't really believe that the discussions will turn much upon the history. Okay? The historical factors have been set out and provided. Venezuela, I don't think, is in a position to seriously question before a court uh, the historical facts. So what the court is going to be focusing on largely, and I, I don't want to appear presumptuous here, the court will focus largely on this. Are there rules that say that a treaty between two countries is null and void? And the answer to that is yes, there are uh, rules which say, well, if the court exceeded its power, if there, were if there was fraud, if you've subsequently perhaps even uh, signed a new treaty which um, explicitly overturns the last, the last one or replaces it, these are circumstances in which you can say, well, this treaty no longer applies. And that is not going to be mostly a historical issue. It's going to be a question of, first of all, establishing what exactly it is that caused Venezuela to be saying the treaty is null and void. Now, some of the issues are absurd. As I told you, the suggestion that the, the chairman and his four counterparts didn't have any Venezuelans when, in fact, it was Venezuela who chose three of them uh, that is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But there are specific legal um, processes that can be examined. And uh, that is what I think the lawyers will be called upon uh, between now and March of 2023 to establish that nothing has happened to overturn these treaties. Two, which we know for most of the period since 1895, Venezuela has accepted both the Treaty of 1899 and accepted the product and kept hold of it. As I said to you, the, the largest and perhaps most valuable piece of real estate in the world today is the mouth of the Orinoco River, where most of Venezuela's oil reserves and, and so forth lie. And the reason why the U.S. itself was interested in encouraging Venezuela to fight down Britain was because Venezuela, uh, the, U the U.S., did not want Britain to close the U.S. out from what is a major commercial um, thoroughfare that goes past uh, the mouth of the Orinoco, past the south of Trinidad. And, and that was the purpose behind that. That is why the U.S. was involved in the first place. They don't have any other interest. It's not their, it's not their land. And they didn't seek to get the land themselves. They, used, they sought to use uh, Venezuela to, as a weapon for beating Britain over the head with. Mm. And if Venezuela has the mouth of the Orinoco, then Britain can't control it. And Venezuela and the United States, except for the period of Chavez and post Chavez have been very, very close allies. And this is, this is why Guyana has to do its own diplomatic work. It's not, it's not easy, easy going because you think, uh, you know, you like the American ambassador, you, you met the president sometime, the president of the US, everything is okay. The Venezuelans have traditionally been very close to the United States. And they are, there are large communities in the US that are close in, in Venezuela that are, are close to business and government interests in um, the United States. And so you have to watch that. So it's not a slam dunk. Is there any other um, border question, Dr. Rowe, because you want to move on to some other areas? Yeah, I want to ask a couple of quick questions about the border. If you're telling us that the 1899 treaty, Venezuela accepted it, then why are we in court today? You are in court because Venezuela is telling the world 
that the treaty is no longer non, is no longer valid. And it's a long time since that treaty was signed. So not everybody remembers. You've also had a period of a moratorium during which time people forgot what the story is about. And some of the people that, some of the countries that were allies, that generation of leaders has died off. And so the, the easiest and most definitive way of establishing the lie that Venezuela tells is to get the top court, the apex court in the world system to pronounce on it. Uh, Mr. Greenwich, here's, here's a key question. The world court, we know the ICJ, International Court of Justice, over the years have made a number of rulings. And more than, if I look at the record, more than 80% have not been enforced. Uh, 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 uh. Don't, 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 don't no. commit yourself to that percentage. No, no, you yeah. Can percentage. No, don't, say, check, don't commit no, yourself I, to I the this. Now, the thing is, the <laughs> only time, even the United States, when they had rulings against them, did not accede to the ICJ's ruling or decision. Now, if the ruling is made that Guyana belongs to Guyana, or the territory of Venezuela is claiming belongs to Guyana, and Venezuela say, we do not accept that ruling, what are the consequences? Well, the consequences are not consequences for Guyana, they are consequences for Venezuela, because the, the world court, the ICJ, is the apex court in the world. And any court that makes a decision, whilst it may not have an army, it depends for its effectiveness on its members respecting its decisions and enforcing its decisions. So Venezuela will have to face the consequences of bucking the global, global system. They already have, have, are aware of the price of bucking the system. And if they attempt uh, to do so and the measures are more severe, then I think they will have a difficulty um, uh, going forward. You know, already they complain about the consequences of the sanctions and have been speaking to the US with a view to having those sanctions either removed or reduced. Why would they, where they admit having difficulty coping with the consequences of those sanctions, why would they put themselves in harm's way further? Uh, uh, Mr. Greenwich, when we talk about sanctions, yes, and I wrote about this, actually don't work against the people who are breaching the laws. It well, works against the average person in the country. That, no, that's, Venezuela's, that's Venezuela's problem. Yeah, it's the so, people of Venezuela that that will be affected. Yeah, well, the people. Yeah, and Maduro will tell you just like Castro, they don't care. We but we I, will not. Buck I don't know that. Elections. I don't know. He said that publicly. No, no, he didn't say this. But you know, Venezuela has been having sanctions from day one to remove yes. Maduro to remove him, and he's still in office, and he'll be having election another three or four months, and he's going to rig it again, and he's going to stay in office. And so he, what I'm saying to you, sanctions and, work against the small man, not those who are breaching it. So my my question is, and also, as mm -hmm. you're aware, OPEC cut back of 2% of its oil. The US is planning to ease sanctions against Venezuela. Are you aware of that? I am aware of that discussion. So where, where do we go from here? We are, I, I think we are in as good a position as is possible for us to be. You can't... Uh, you can't um, assume that uh, the international community will just sit and allow Venezuela to do what it likes. With Mr. Grenier, in, in all due respect. With respect, with respect to the The international community when it comes to the ICJ decisions and rulings is the United States. And if they don't take action, no other country will take action against another country. But mm -hmm. let, me, let me go to no, something. No, it's not only the United States. Let me remind you of a couple of things. I, okay. I hear you. Okay. I, I, I anticipated that you may want to to, uh, <laughs> to raise that point. And I have, again, I published something in Starbuck News saying, calling implementation pessimism. Okay. If, if the court says, hey, 
don't believe that it will have no effect because it does have an effect. You may not have it uh, implemented fully or immediately, but let me just remind you, one of the worst cases was the case of Cameroon and Nigeria. Do you Nigeria, remember? Yeah, I, I know about that one, yeah. But do you know where it is now? No, where it is? Well, Nigeria has decided to accept the, the court's decision, notwithstanding the years, the years of bluster and fury coming out of Nigeria. But, but Nigeria accepts the court's decision based on negotiation between Nigeria and Cameroon, though. But it, Not doesn't matter. it doesn't matter. That's what I was saying to you just now, that you can't assume that the court will do all of the work for you, and therefore you can close down your foreign service. That is what I'm, that's the, that's the message I'm trying to hammer all the time to my principles, both now and prior to 2020. You have to keep your foreign service sharp because even if you win the court case, there is going to be diplomatic work that you have to carry out. You have to work on the US, you have to work on Venezuela's friends, you have to work on Venezuela's enemies, all of them. It isn't, it, you'll be lucky if you get a court decision on on a matter as contentious as this and get the, the 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 whole world saying yes we agree with you but for most instances even even outside of the icj it's not peculiar to the icj they um they they are the it is necessary for you to work with others i'm looking at looking at some of the things i have here nicaragua versus colombia world court orders stuff and in it, it's saying Colombia initially rejected the ICJ's jurisdiction. Somalia versus Kenya. Kenya says it's not going to accept. Exactly. Costa Rica versus. Same Costa thing. No, but they, they, they ain't got any place to go with that. Then Nicaragua versus Costa Rica. And, and that one seems to be um, uh, on the way to being settled. Peru versus Chile, sea disputes settled in court. They recognize Nigeria, Niger, and Burkina Faso resolved territorial disputes. They, they recognize that you can't solve the problem by cussing out each other, and you can't solve the problem by going to war. Because Nigeria used its powers to try and bully Cameroon, and they didn't get anywhere. Cameroon went to the court, and the court decided in favor of Nigeria. Nigeria bucked it for years and eventually uh, eventually agreed. So what we are seeing also, at least until the Russian invasion of Ukraine, what you are seeing is a, is a process by which countries have been made to reluctantly fall in line with the court's decision. I am not going to give you a number, but most border disputes, if you go back to history, mm -hmm. have been resolved through wars. But most of the most of the wars that have taken place have taken place before the ICJ was established. Uh, but so even, even after, even after the, the ICJ method, was established, no, that was the method for resolving a border disputes prior to the Second World War. No, but but, but yeah, you know but the ICJ was. Even when the ICJ was established, there have been 17 border disputes that settled through wars. 17 were settled yeah. through wars? But yes, we are not, after the ICJ was established. Here in Latin America, how many wars you've had to settle the border disputes in recent times? Because this is the region you're in. Don't worry with what is happening in the Far East. Okay? You're in the Latin America. I'm looking, I'm looking at the global... I'm no, 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 no. You're in Latin America. And Latin America, as you will be aware, has had a relatively good history of, of uh, regionalism. In fact, there's even a mechanism by which they, they have agreed to a multilateral or a regional uh, re resolution of, uh, of their problems, including border disputes. And I've named you at least four countries in the region, not that there are that many in the region, who have agreed, um, who have try to solve their problems through the court. At least if it goes to the court, you can't be telling your neighbors, look, don't worry with what Peru or Venezuela tells you, A and B are untrue. 
the facts and the legal analysis will have been established. And what men are now trying to bank on is on their military muscle. And this, the, 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 the region as a whole and the world in general is not going to be accepting the solution of these matters by military might because it, 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 it has no advantage except for the very big and those who have money. Before we leave this topic, you okay. mentioned something that, that we have to work, do a lot of diplomacy yes. and so forth. Venezuela is doing that from the latest readings, and Dr. Shami mentioned that last week on our show. Yes. That Venezuela is doing that a lot. Is Guyana doing that? And who in Guyana is doing that where? Well, the, the committee that has been looking at this with a view to advising the government has drawn this to the government's attention many times. I believe even the lawyers the lawyers abroad have drawn it to their attention. The need for you to have the best possible people in all the positions, irrespective, irrespective of their political standing, their right. political coloration and all of that. Right. And it remains now, I mean, I can only say that it's for the public and it is for the leaders to ensure that they do that. Because if the thing fails, if we run into difficulties for a leader, you can't afford to have the public turn to you and say, but you know, you have failed to utilize the following skills available to you. It, it is, of course, a constant process. And Guyana being what it is, Guyana is prone to all sorts of idiosyncrasies where people are excluded for all sorts of reasons, most of which would not be acceptable elsewhere. So it, it is not Venezuela that you have to blame our biggest problems here. We have to make sure that we make the best of the skills available to us. And, and I checked, not only the Middle East, Venezuela lobbying, Venice, Maduro's in Africa lobbying the Africans yeah. too. And he's in Asia lobbying them as well. Correct. As much as they are from those countries. But you, you know, of course, that we were, we were uh, in terms of our influence, uh, I had sat as president, negotiator, uh, um, uh, regional representative on all the key bodies of the African Caribbean and Pacific group. And the African Caribbean and Pacific group in 2016 uh, issued one of the strongest statements against Venezuela that it was. You will know that also I work very closely with the Commonwealth and the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. And we had Bangladesh after South Africa, and then more recently Bangladesh, and I think Jamaica had stepped in at one stage to help by being chairman of the, of the group dealing with the Ghana border controversy and the complaints against Venezuela. And we've had very good support We've had very, very good support, very strong declarations, very strong resolutions, and I can only urge that that work be continued. Charles? So Ambassador, do you think our government is doing everything possible to pick up where you left off when you were in the coalition? In terms of, in terms of having our diplomats um, Doing Lobby. those things that Dr. Lobbying. Rose talked about. Lobbying other countries. Yeah. Well, I think there may be a difference of views as to as to the most effective level at which lobbying has to be done. I, I don't want to get into that for the moment, but but I I think we probably don't see eye to eye on the intensity and the level of lobbying. I believe you have to lobby at all levels all levels and especially you see in our people and Ghana is a funny place as i say to you a man or a woman and well mostly a man will meet you on the corner whether it's over a drink or not over a drink and tell you something and when you listen you can say my god this person is very knowledgeable he's very right and two minutes later or two days later you will discover that the person really didn't know what they were talking about. This is how Guyanese gaff. It is very, very definitive and unequivocal. You, you are, they're so certain 
yes, this is the case. Yes, I know that. And in fact, it is only sometimes the product of their limited experience that they're delivering to you. They don't know for certain. And one of our problems is that people that are not experienced in these areas believe that whatever they believe is right. And so sometimes when you advise other things be done, they're not always treated um, seriously. But Mr. We Ambassador, have to get beyond that. Hmm? I'm sorry, with you being a diplomat, with uh, Sri Ramphal being a diplomat, are you having these meetings with the foreign ministry and the president and whoever is responsible to ensure we beefed up and we kind of accelerate the, the diplomacy for lobbying across the globe? which include the ACP, include the Middle East, include CARICOM, and whichever area that is important to us? Well, that process clearly is not complete because in many of the key places, you don't yet have ambassadors. If you're dealing with the ACP, you have to have an ambassador in Brussels. Uh, if you are dealing with the Commonwealth, you have to have an experienced ambassador in London and a team there that is capable of doing the lobbying. You have to have persons or officers in Africa. We don't generally have any, any in the Pacific um, outside of China, for example. You, you don't have anyone out there, but you could do. You could look at that. Um, and in the Middle East, we don't have any. In the Middle East, yes, you have, a, you have the ambassador who was in the Ku Kuwait and has been moved to the UAE. And um, I believe that they are looking at uh, appointing somebody in Kuwait. But you, you, have, to, you have to have those posts uh, filled and filled with people of competence and experience. And that uh, I hope we will see. Would you want to give us, um, I don't know if you want to do it, you don't have to. But what is your, um, what was our relationship with Ambassador um, that we had in the Middle East, Dr. Sh uh, Shamir? What is my, I know him. Uh, it was I who appointed him. And do you think he did a good job there? Well, he, he did, yeah. So why but was what he? Specifically, what specifically? Uh, well, we had him on our program last week and he was uh, talking about the, the importance of you know, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, Bahrain, and, and, and he didn't mention us, Dr. Rose mentioned that um, Venezuela is using, they're very close with, with those regime because of course they're OPEC. And he said that the, he was almost at all the meetings that was part of those negotiating Guyana. And he, he's afraid that that's not happening now. Well, I, I don't know what is happening now because I'm not close enough to that. But what, uh, what I can say is that uh, the government has stated, and, and you have to remember, let, let me step, step back a, a while. We have, as I think I said in 2018, an ideal opportunity to work with the countries of the Middle East uh, at this time be, as part of a wells oil strategy of petrol diplomacy, okay? Because we have common interests there and we can work with them in this regard. Of course, there are other cultural things. These are largely Muslim countries. And uh, in the past, we've tried to see if we could assign members from foreign affairs who have that type of, a, who have that type of background. Uh, it helps in communicating, moving around and so forth. And uh, at the same time, to have discussions in the commercial, on the commercial side. I believe such discussions have taken place. You, you would have heard of some uh, proposals in relation to uh, collaborating on the petroleum front. But as regards the diplomatic front, it, be, it is also a little tricky and difficult um, for for reasons that may have to do sometimes with the standing of the countries in 
in the context of the UN, in the context of other partners. But I know that the government is aware of the import of this. It has been raised with them and they themselves uh, have pronounced publicly on it as you would have seen in the paper from time to time. Okay. How effective that so, is? I, I, I just want to mention this. Dr. Shami mentioned that in that part of the world, the Middle East, a lot of things are being discussed informally. Like you go to the mosque, you meet with this person, that person, sure, sure, and this will lay the foundation. But if you don't have someone with a Muslim background, how are we going to get these things done? Well, the, well, pers the person who is... Uh, who is uh, um, now in the UAE um, does have that background. Okay. Okay. The question you may want to ask is what is to happen in Kuwait, which is what the, the current government has done. Instead of having the embassy in Kuwait, um, they decided they have it in Kuwait and in the UAE. But the person to go to Kuwait has not been appointed. As far as I'm aware, nobody's been sent there yet. Right. And Ambassador, the, um, the, what Ambassador Shamir also said is that the current ambassador to the UAE, he was not a good performer when he was there as ambassador in, in, in when Ambassador Shamir Ali was ambassador in Kuwait. This person but, was not, and, and he said all the reports are at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So. That's a well, just just be careful. You're dealing actually with somebody. You're not dealing. You're not saying an ambassador. You're talking about somebody very specific here. Yeah, you yeah. with me? Yeah. Uh, and it is not my impression from the reports of the of the ministry. Uh, you see, an ambassador may find himself in an office with one person or with twenty, and he may take. Uh, umbrage or take a dislike to that person. Yeah. What you have to do when you see that happening or when you get the report is to try and separate the personal from the organizational. I got you. Yeah. And I don't think that his assessment of that officer is shared. Okay. Can we, can we change? I want to switch a little, if you don't mind. Um, we were informed, Mr. Ambassador, and you don't have to, well, I hope you can confirm it, that when we negotiated the oil contract with Exxon, that you are one of the four persons who are responsible for that contract. Is there any truth to that statement? Uh, there is no truth in it. So you had no part to play in the in the negotiation of the contract with Exxon. No, I didn't, and I hesitate because I, I really don't don't know how far to respond. If you look at the newspapers, okay, and the reports from Mr. Joe Harmon and the president himself, when the time came to deal with the question of Exxon. Whether it's the, whether you're speaking of the contract as of 2016 or 2019, or the other things to do with the pipeline, because when you say contract, I'm not 100% sure what you mean. There are many dimensions. Well, the one in 2015, the one that was signed in 2015, yes. Well, the, 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 the contract was signed in 2016, I believe, but that contract uh, was signed by, it was not signed by four ministers, which is, which is really why I'm hesitating, because I don't really know, I don't know where you... No, I got, I got that, that Ambassador, I got that. There are some report was signed in 2015, some is saying 2016, but I'll take your word, it's 2016. Right, the cabinet we were also told that it was the president, President Granger, um, Minister Trotman, Minister Greenwich, and an advisor to the president. The four of you were the that, that, architect that, of that. The very person who tells you that has been, has been guilty frequently of such malicious reports. Let me, let me say to you that, first of all, and that's why I, 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 I hesitate, because I don't want to get embroiled and alone, but it's, it's a little complicated. First of all, 
the the oversight for matters to do with petroleum was undertaken by four ministers. That's the president directed at four ministers. So that's what one part of your question pertains to those four ministers. Those ministers would would have been Minister Harmon, Minister the Minister of Finance, uh, Minister of uh, of Minister Trotman, uh, and uh, Minister um, Minister who was responsible for what is his name again? Um, my apologies. Min the minister, the president's son-in-law. Oh, okay. Dominic Gaskin. Minister Gaskin. So those four ministers at, uh, I think for most of the period, had a responsibility oversight-wise when decisions were to be made in the wider context, um, pipeline and the, and the like, they had that responsibility. My, my name uh, touches upon those four when I was, and I think Minister Minister Patterson. Yeah. Right? They called it four plus one. But people assumed the one was me. I wasn't the one. Okay. I was once involved in that exercise, and that is when the team went to Houston. At, the, at, at a certain point in time, a couple of days before the team left, uh, for reasons that I'm not clear about, but they, they, they claim to, to have recommended to the president that I be asked to go with the team and, and undertake oversight. So I attended that meeting and uh, participated in those discussions, which involved, amongst other things, uh, asking about the terms on which oil, gas was to be made available to the government. Uh, the government was to indicate, it didn't at that time, what it would want to do, uh, when it would retain um, a contractor to build a pipeline and so forth. I'm sure you don't want me to get into those now, but I'm just giving you an idea of the spread. As regards the question of uh, other things. The original contract, of course, was a was a contract that we uh, entered government and found there. Okay, the elements of the contract again. If it's the same person that that is telling you, giving you that information, that I I'm a, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, is just malicious, not based upon any facts. <laughs> the que no, this is Guyana, you know, people will tell you things and uh, they tell you as though it was given to them by Moses. The, the discussion uh, and the responsibility for the, the petroleum contracts, I was once involved in the discussion on those contracts, even looking at the contract that was sent to us by the government, by the commercial enterprise. And this is uh, before Exxon. This is a problem of uh, Anadarko. You know Anadarko? This is yeah. a company yeah. which had its vessel seized. Right. The contract came to me, and as I always do, I sat down with a set of technicians, including lawyers in foreign affairs. We went through it and made recommendations to Minister Trotman. Okay? That's how I work. Okay, as so you are directly involved. But you know, Ms. Ambassador, 99 seems to be a problem for Guyana. 1899 award, Venezuela is disputing it. 1999, Janet Jagan signed this agreement. Is it 1999? Whatever yes. year it was? Yes. That's a big problem to Guyana, too. So we seem to have a big problem with 99. But are, um, you, su are you superstitious? You are religious. Well, appears, I think you are religious. It appears man. As though Guyana is not a good year for Guyana. And, no. Um, no, the year is what. The number is what you make of it. Okay. And okay. and I will tell you a side to this that that I give you when when people started making uh, noises over the contract, it was proposed to the president that a particular procedure be undertaken to look at the contract more carefully and in a way to uh, protect us with a minimum amount of disruption. If indeed there were any elements in there that are unusual. And 
the president agreed to the procedure and it was never implemented. So in a way we have brought upon ourselves uh, a lot of unnecessary um, blows. Well, Mr. Greenwich, I'm glad agitation. you mentioned, sorry, sorry I'm cutting you off, our time is running out, but the president gave a directive. So who in the government flaunted the government, the president directive? Which was the directive? Well, he said he had a, he established a procedure you guys recommend, whoever recommended, no, the no, president no, agreed to the procedure, I, but was never implemented. No, no. If if it's what I just said, I I recommended to him something put to us by a set of international lawyers who worked on on such contracts. Indeed, these are amongst the biggest in the Middle East. And it is we who chose not to implement it. Who is we? The president himself. Okay. Oh, but I think you just said that the president gave agreed to the no, no, to, no. to the process. No. He agreed to a process involving the four plus one, the okay. minister's four plus one. Who told who told Rafael Trotman to sign the contract? Who told him to sign the contract? Well, a contract is signed in this way. A minister, if he's responsible, he will need, he'll use his technicians and negotiate the contract. And before he signs it, he will either bring it to the president or bring it to the cabinet, or both. And normally he would first bring it to the president, the president would say, go ahead with it, but he will then bring it to the cabinet and the cabinet will approve it, okay? I don't know that the minister, I, I think I said before in a press conference that that particular contract of 2016, um, came to the cabinet, and if people were saying they didn't know, they weren't aware of the contract, I said at the time, I suspect that it is because the title of the contract was long, and um, they're confusing that title with the, the, the signature bonus. People are talking about the signature bonus. If you ask ministers about the signature bonus, I think, understandably, they, they, they were saying, no, they don't know anything about that. The contract, in fact, doesn't say that at the top, if that is what you were talking about. But that, that exercise came to the cabinet. And let me, since you raise it, let me tell you two things. I see a lot of stuff in the newspaper. Again, people speaking on matters that they don't understand. The, 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 uh, the arrangement, as I understand it up to now, in respect of a... Uh, of Exxon is not an arrangement that that you can simply add uh, a royalty of 13% to. I hear people saying, look, let's just increase the royalty to 15%. This is taxation, it's a complicated story. You as an individual, you pay taxes on a variety of things. And if somebody wants to, if, if you want to argue with the commissioner, my tax burden is A, then he has to look at the sum total of taxes you pay before he can say to the, the minister or whoever else what your overall tax burden is. You cannot speak to the royalty alone and say this, the, the tax burden is too low. And you have, if you look at, Many of the, the provisions pertaining to what Exxon pays, and I, I know that a lot of people are going to be shouting, but 90% of them shouting have never looked at the agreements. If you look at the literature in the Caribbean, and mostly not Caribbean, in Latin America and elsewhere, you will find even the provision for uh, if, if the government wants to refund the tax, those provisions are common in many of those agreements. Now, whether you refund it is a different matter. I'm not speaking to that, and I don't know that Kavanaugh ever agreed uh, that the the, the uh, royalty will be refunded, as, as is alleged by some of the writers. But the point is that you ha the overall tax take by the government starts low. That was understood. That is how it's supposed to begin, and that is how... The system works elsewhere with this type of contract. 
which still I still believe is superior to the income tax contract, which which some of your uh, some of your advocates call for. And then it will increase it in, it will increase uh, over time to the point where you may think, let us say, is a 53% of the overall take, uh, or up to 65%. You may still feel that that's too low. But we are discussing as though all the government gets out of this exercise is either two percent or a, or a thirteen or twelve and a half percent, which is not so. It, this is something that w is worthy of more careful consideration than Guyana gives it. A lot of rubbish is spoken about the that tax framework, and I, I am. You know what? Ambassador, I think we'll have to invite you back in this program to discuss exactly that because I think a lot of people disagree with what you just said. Some people yeah, wholeheartedly agree with you. Yeah, but a lot of them don't even disagree. Look. They read what is in the newspapers, the constant diet of abuse. I mean, I seen a newspaper report last Sunday yeah. describing ministers in the most and, and politicians in the most offensive way. And do you know something? That the, the persons who fund and promote that sort of language were themselves worthy of that type of description because they themselves have had trouble across the line that divides the lawful and the unlawful. We have to be responsible in how we dialogue. You can't just resort to abuse because the other side doesn't agree with you. And that is one of our biggest failings. Sorry. We have a lot of questions on this oil and gas. <laughs> and I really would want you to come back so we can talk about uh -huh. it. We spend a lot of time on the border, and I think that's important because that's what you look at here right now. But this contract, maybe we'll bring some other um, resource person to work to, to be with you in the program so we can discuss this in generality to ensure that Guyanese really understand that's correct. What that's we have signed, because there are some is there are some who would think that Exxon will drag on the cost to recapture the capital cost for as long as possible. And over time, we will not get that bonanza that you know well, some others are talking about. But that's a different question altogether. Contract is not time insensitive, you know. You can't just collect money forever. And if it happens, you know, let me just sorry, let me just say it. One of the points I raised when a certain newspaper had its officer called me, and I said to them, "Listen, you would be better advised to to press the government, hold the government's feet to the fire, and ensure that it brings in skills." and puts them in inland revenue because it has decided that it's inland revenue that must manage this business. And I found when I was in Brazil, somebody called me and said, what did you do to the owner of this newspaper? I said, nothing. They said, this man, this person has accused you of being a vagabond and a thief. <laughs> that is how Guyana conducts this debate. That is how Guyana conducts this debate. But, 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 but. That was put in the newspaper because I said, look, pay attention. And, and the same people are now saying, no, you must collect more taxes. You but, have to do that from the beginning. You but, have to put in place a team to audit and to manage the business. Even, even the, the advisor that you mentioned just now. I've seen him write something in the newspaper saying tax people don't know anything about tax people don't know anything. Inland revenue people don't know anything about uh, about the taxation of companies. Well, if they don't know anything about taxation of companies, then they shouldn't be in the business because the main taxes that the GRA is supposed to be collecting in this country prior to the oil were the taxation of, was the taxation of companies. Yes. Right? And now it is also the taxation of companies. Not oil, be one of the, you know, it's great for you to be here, Thomas, rather than us. Um, Dr. Rose, and before anything close, anything in closing? No, Ambassador, do you have anything in closing before? No, no, I just thank you for the opportunity to uh, to discuss some of these things. And again, to say to you, I'm glad that you can have a forum for examining some of these things without the vitriol that sometimes enters it into it in Guyana. I mean, what I see here in terms of that sort of abuse, you don't see it in Suriname. You, know? you don't well, see it even Ambassador, in I want you to promise us that you'll come back and let's talk about the oil and gas contract. Well, if the terms are right, I will come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, my closing comment is this. Several world leaders, including many United States presidents, have refused to read articles that shower praise on them.
for their actions and policies. Yes. They prefer criticism to assess their effectiveness in governance because they believe that it's very easy for leaders to become trapped in a bubble of success, which can be false. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with them in that regard. And I'm not asking you to invite me so that people <laughs> will praise me for it. I, of all ministers, let me tell you this, you may not remember, I have suffered more abuse from the press, and criticisms rather, press and the opposition than almost any other. From the period beginning in 83, when I was at, for, uh, when I was at uh, the Ministry of Finance, up to when I moved to Foreign Affairs. Uh, let me just say this. <laughs> These leaders prefer criticism to assess their effectiveness in governance. I heard you. Because they can become easily trapped in a bubble of success, which can be false. So criticism is not always bad. Criticism doesn't mean that you're against a party, against a government, or against anyone. It is called constructive criticism. Ah, no, no, no. Criticism isn't called constructive criticism. <laughs> criticism is useful if you make it constructive rather okay. than abusive. And that's why I'm saying right. one of the distinctive features of Guyana is that element, the abuse. Yeah. So we must not condemn someone if they criticize something. Listen to the criticism and if it makes sense, then you should take action to correct whatever the person is saying. If it doesn't make sense, you can cast it away. But as you said, Mr. Greenwich, in Guyana, you criticize something and you're being abused. You're being ostracized by people left, right, and center. Yes, I, I agree. This is a feature of our debates, which is not good. It's not healthy. Exactly. And people should, be, should not be this thin-skinned, especially public officials. You have to have a broad sense of understanding that not everything you do and say will be right for each individual. Some will oppose, but listen to what they have to say. And if it makes sense, you can adjust and rectify the situation. Finally, I'm calling for an increase in salary for all starting salary for all public servants, uh, teachers, uh, nurses, and everybody else. Uh, a start, a start salary of hundred fifty thousand dollars a month. I'm uh, calling for GT and T to provide better internet services. I know people's services have been cut off, not cut off have been disconnected or not working for four or five days in a week, but they still have to pay the full amount at the end of the month, or else GTD will cut them off. And also I'm calling on all public servants, civil servants, please be courteous to the public. And please answer your telephones. Public service in Ghana, I'm saying this because I did there, I checked it. They do not answer the telephones. A few does, but not too many. So that's what I have to say to all Guyanese. Be courteous to each other. Let us support President Ali's One Guyana Initiative. It can only do good for the country. I don't care who proposed it. Let us support it and see where it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Thank you, Ambassador Greenwich. And we want to thank our viewers. We want to thank again Noir Singh and Devin for staying up with us. And to you audience out there, thank you so much for being with us. Until next week, 